join them to battle the Assyrians. So the Syrians, the northern ten tribes, want Judah to join them, and Isaiah says, no, you don't have to do that. And don't trust the Assyrians either, trust in God. And so God sends Isaiah to King Ahaz to give him a word, and it includes that, that pro prophetic message that we look to at this time of year. So it's Isaiah speaking to King Ahaz. Ask your Lord, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, hear now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. And then I ask you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Uh, in the church we call this, the, when the angel visits Mary, the Annunciation. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. This ends the reading of God's word for us this morning. <clears throat> Dear people of God, when in full-time ministry, what I like to do is, is join the local ministerial. A ministerial is made up of ministers from various denominations. And in Stratford, it was, it was Mennonite, Baptist, Pentecostals, Catholic, um, Presbyterian, United Church. But what was interesting in both those ministerials, the one in Stratford, the one in, uh, it was actually Petrolia, who I became close to, who I gravitated toward. In Stratford, it was two Pentecostals, Charlie and John, and a Catholic priest, Tom. What was interesting with those three is we focused on what united us, what we have in common, Christ crucified, and they very carefully stayed away from things that we find difficult. Like with the Catholic Church, I, there's things that, like the whole Mariology, uh, transubstantiation, the saints. Tom never, ever talked about that. In fact, I heard him uh, give two homilies. A homily is a Catholic sermon, a short meditation. I heard him and several other Catholic priests at Right to Life, they would give homilies that could be preached in this church and at the URC down the street, Christ crucified. With these three, 
um, the two Pentecostals, Charlie and John, what they did is they rented an office space downtown Stratford and they turned it into a prayer room. And so we would get together with them uh, Tuesdays at nine o'clock for prayer. And Pentecostals pray really loud. They think God can't hear them, I think. And then Tom, the priest, would do very liturgical prayer, and I would give the normal prayers, because I'm a Calvinist, right? We pray normally. But what was interesting in the ministerial is who I did not grow close to. About the fifth year I was there, and what we, they did is they did a rotation of ministers would be the chair. It wasn't really an honor. It was more of somebody's got to run this, so somebody's got to take a turn and lead the meetings. About the fifth year, it was a Presbyterian, and you would think a Presbyterian would be somebody I would gravitate to because we come out of the same uh, John Calvin tradition. And this particular man was, he was, he was, uh, handsome, debonair, funny, uh, and you'd think I, you know, there's somebody I would gravitate to, but over the first three, four years, I never really had a conversation with this guy. Didn't hear too much. When he became the chair, of course, now I'm going to hear him speak more and more. After he was, he led four or five meetings, I'm starting to have questions about his theology. So, on this Tuesday morning prayer meeting with the Pentecostals and the priests, I said, you know, I'm kind of curious what this guy believes. And they said, yeah, we do too. So John, the Pentecostal, said, well, I'll ask him. I thought, well, there, that's kind of dangerous. But John has this good heart, and he's careful. So a couple of weeks later at the next ministerial, he waited toward the end when most of the people had left, but John was there, Charlie was there, Tom, me, and maybe one or two others. And he said to the chair, kind of casually, he said, and I like the way he presented, he said, I'm curious what you think about the Apostles' Creed. I thought, oh, that's a good way. And this is what the chair answered, and this is the crux of the sermon. The chair said to us, oh, I can recite the Apostles' Creed with you, Oh, I mumble, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born with the Virgin Mary, but for the rest, I can recite with you. I mumble, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Father Tom was sitting next to me, and he turns to me and goes, that's a pretty big mumble. That's a big, big mumble. The sad thing I learned in Stratford over a course of a couple of years there were three other Presbyterian ministers who denied Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Four. I played hockey with one. One was the chair. One lived down the street from me. The fourth, I, I didn't know, but I knew uh, their theology. I knew a fifth Presbyterian minister. He's a good friend, John Frazier. And if you imagine our classes, they have a presbytery. He would go to presbytery knowing four of his colleagues denied Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. There's a sad reality that has happened within the church over the last two, three hundred years. What happens is this. Knowledge from the beginning of human history, knowledge started kind of slow. Kind of went like this. You know, you, you know, we invented the wheel. Okay, good. And it keeps going like that. And then two, three hundred years ago, knowledge starts to go like this. Now, the sad thing in the church is as our knowledge goes like this, the more we dumb down God and took away his power. You would think it would be the other way around. You would think as we grow in knowledge, our impression of God would grow because you got to think about God. When the first person invented the wheel, God said, hey, way to go. Now, just wait until the 20th century. You get to roll around on radial tires. You know, that'll be, you got to wait a few centuries, right? And then when somebody thought, you know, we should dig a pit and have an outhouse, God said, hey, wait till the 20th century when you get indoor plumbing. It'll take a while for Newfoundland and Mississippi, but that's okay. They'll catch up. Every good idea we come up with, God has been there before waiting for us. But the sad, sad truth is in the church, as knowledge grows, 
people start dumbing down God and taking away his power. And so we have it within the mainline churches. They deny Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit, not all. In the United Church, I don't know what the percentage is. In the uh, Wyoming uh, ministerial is a United Church, Jim Breen. He is a five-point Calvinist as orthodox as any one of us here. I said, but how do you go to your presbytery? He says, that's my mission field. He has to go to presbytery to preach the gospel to his colleagues. I asked him one time, well, how many in that presbytery of the United Church deny Christ? And he said, that's about 50-50. But the United Church is not dead. I remember uh, in Stratford, I'd be assigned to preach at different churches, you know, pulpit supply. You drive through, and you see a little United Church, and the parking lot is full. I conclude that minister is preaching the gospel, and the Holy Spirit is at work. So the United Church is, is struggling, but it's not dead. Now, to address this issue, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, we have to go back in time, or before time. And one of the best ways to do that is Ephesians 1, verse 4. <clears throat> and this verse says so much. It says, For God chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world. So what that means, that means before God spoke his first word in the beginning, before that, he knew, he knew how he was going to create the heavens and the earth, he would, you know, he'd have uh, planet earth, the sun, moon, and stars, there'd be galaxies, he would create the laws of nature, uh, laws of morality. By the way, we didn't have, he didn't have the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments were in the mind of God in eternity. He knew exactly how he was going to create it. And he knew he would create Adam and Eve in his image. And that's where the problem begins. If he creates Adam and Eve in his image, he has to give them freedom or free will. He has to create them so they have the freedom to love him through trust and obedience, but they also have to have the freedom to hate him through mistrust and disobedience. There's no other way. And there's always the, the question, well, why didn't God create us so we wouldn't sin? But that's not free will. There's certain things God cannot do. God cannot be illogical. Dr. Cooper at the seminary said, God cannot create married bachelors. That's a contradiction in term. And his second favorite was, God cannot make square circles. He can't be illogical. If he decides to create people in his image, and there's a purpose, because there's a special way. Now, all creation gives him glory, like a black lab, a quarter horse. I don't know about mosquitoes, but that's just me. I just don't know how they do it. But people are created in his image so we can commute. We are the only ones can gather and praise him. We're the only ones who can pray to him. So we have to have that freedom. So God knew, but he also knew at that time that Adam and Eve would choose to disobey him. So now he's got a problem. Now he's got a mess. Because when sin enters the world, it perme it's got this power, and it just permeates everything. So now he's got this mess. What is he going to do? And in, in the mind of God, he's got a couple of choices. Before he speaks the first word, he can just say, well, I'm going to scrap this whole creation idea. It's just too much of a mess. Or he could say, well, I'll go, and maybe this time they won't sin, but if they do sin, well, I'll just leave it to Satan. But that's not who God is. That's not who God is. So before the first word of creation, he knows that we are going to fall into sin and he will choose specific people for salvation. And to make sure that they, they accept him, they have to hear the gospel, understand the gospel, and accept the gospel. But the biggest thing is he has to redeem them. And now he's got this problem. The problem God has is he's got 
He's got this perfect sense of justice. He can't ignore sin. He can't kind of forgive it and let it go, punish it a little bit. That's, that's, he can't do that. The second problem he has, if he's going to, if, if paradise is lost, he's got to fix it all the way back. Not just kind of cobble it together, you know, like I used to do with my 64 Bel Air, you know, you, the classic Baylor twine, and you know, you, no, it's got to be perfect. And the other issue he has is this. What sin is, it's, it's a person turning their back on the person who gives them life. And when we sin, we are accepting death. Because the, we get life from God, we sin, we turn our back, and we say, I'm accepting death. And so to restore creation, there has to be a sacrifice. There has to be something that will bring this whole plan of salvation to completion. Paradise has to be restored. Sin must be punished. Sin, ha- not only just punished, it has to be eradicated. And creation has to be completely restored. And, and you know, it's, it's easier to, to build and start from scratch, but when you have this house or castle or whatever, or old car that's been neglected for for decades to try and restore it, you have this incredible mess that you're going to try to bring back to perfection. And trying to to fix a mess and bring it back to perfection is just the most difficult job. Sometimes when I drive around, I'll see a pickup. Now typically this pickup that I'm thinking of, it'll always have a lift kit the big tires and no muffler. And on the back it says, get her done, get her done. Now the owner of that pickup is saying, you give me any task and I'll get it done. I don't care how difficult it is, I don't care how hard I gotta go at it, I don't care what I gotta spend, I don't care, I will be creative, I'm going to get her done, get her done. That phrase did not originate with rednecks. It originated with the holy Lord God of the heavens and the earth. You talk about get her done, he's got this impossible task. And so to get her done, God chose us. But he also, from our text two weeks ago in the afternoon service, 1 Peter chapter 1, 19 and 20, we were redeemed with the precious blood of the Lamb of Christ, the lamb without blemish, he was chosen before the creation of the world. God knew the plan. And so for the Lord's God's perfect justice to met, be met, the sacrifice, sacrifice has to meet conditions. First, the sacrifice has to be a person because it was, it's us, we're people. Bulls don't sin, sheep don't sin. All those sacrifices of the Old Testament were were prophetic symbols, but they didn't get it done. The second problem God faces is this sacrifice has to be perfect. He is perfect. He's holy. The problem is all of creation is permeated with sin, so now he's got this problem. Where am I going to get the perfect sacrifice? But the third problem he has is it's got to be the greatest sacrifice. It has to be so great, so great that it covers, it doesn't just punish sin, it eradicates sin and it restores all of creation. So he's got that challenge. And so the angel comes to Mary and says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And so, brothers and sisters, together we confess, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Then with the Belgic Confession, we confess that Jesus Christ is fully 100% God and fully 100% Son of Mary, one of us. 
And then Anselm, the theologian, connected the dots. Anselm puts it this way. Jesus is the right human sacrifice for human sin. Second, because he's divine, he's the perfect lamb without blemish sacrifice for sin. And third, because he's divine, he's the complete sacrifice. There's no greater sacrifice. On, on the cross, in those six hours, he could receive the eternity of hell I deserve, and he got it in six hours, and yours. But there's more. God doesn't want us to think he came up with this incarnation idea on the run, so to speak. He wants us to understand his sovereign power and wisdom. And so our salvation rests in his divine will before that first word of creation. And to kind of cement this, we have all these Old Testament prophecies, the one from Isaiah, that give us further assurance that Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 100% God, 100% us, the right human, perfect, complete sacrifice. The, the, the prophecies confirm for us, that's right, God was working all along. And so we come here this morning, and I'm wondering if, if there's three different types of people here. I don't know you well enough. But Jesus asks you, who do you say that I am? So I'm kind of curious. I'm, it's a rhetorical question. Do you say with doubting Thomas when, he, when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? He says, my Lord and my God. I'm assuming most of you do confess Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 100% God, 100% one of us, the right human, perfect, complete sacrifice. You accept this time of year as a great time of celebrating God's, it's, I think of Christmas as celebrating God's wisdom and power. He came up with this idea, my son will crash into creation and be that perfect atonement. So if you, if you grab on to this, I praise God. It's a, it's a sign of his mercy in your life. But there may be some of you who fit into a second category. You might think this Christmas story is a myth. You might think, well, you know, it's kind of fantastic. You know, it's an old wives' tale, medieval. I invite you to reconsider with this story. In Stratford, about 15 years ago, we were at, Grace and I were at a, a Christmas dinner, and there was a total of five uh, couples about our age, a little younger. And at the end of the meal, at the end of the evening, one of the guys, he was kind of waiting to be with me alone, and he kind of, the funny thing about this guy, he never, faces me. He always is sideways. So you're always, you know, talk to me like this. No, he's always, so you're always, anyways. He kind of turns to me and says, you know, Bill, this incarnation conceived by the Holy Spirit, the virgin birth, you know. Really? You believe that? This guy's a hog farmer. I just started laughing. I said, really? You can artificially impregnate a sow without a boar within 500 miles, and you think God can't do, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary? He looks at me and goes, I never thought of that. I believe! is possibly the funniest come-to-Jesus moment I've ever experienced in my life. I've seen him twice in the last 10 years. Every time he sees me, he goes, I believe! I go, thank God for that. If you have doubts, if you have doubts, when I was a kid, we had the landing, the man on the moon. If we can put a man on the moon, certainly we can believe that God had his son conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. 
Today, fertility doctors can create life in a petri dish. If they can do that, I would invite you to believe. And there's a very important thing. And this is a thing that I struggle with, with, with ministers, especially in the broader church who deny this. I go, well, like, why do you want to give that up? Because if Jesus is not conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, the man on the cross is a lunatic. Then we're down, we're in the same category as Jews and Muslims and everybody else. We have to rely on works righteousness, and that's not going to work. Because to be in a relationship with God, let alone to enter his presence, we, have, we can't be close, we have to be perfect. And we are only perfect through the blood of Jesus Christ. So on the cross, I want Jesus, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 100% God, 100% man, right human, perfect, complete sacrifice. If you have doubts, then what do you got? If you have doubts, I invite you to pray. Pray that the Holy Spirit can give you the assurance the assurance. But I'd also invite you, as you see what we, we little humans can do, that ought to give you confidence of what God can do. But here today, there might be a third group. You believe the incarnation is true, but you live as though it's not. And that's who I was until uh, February 1980. My dad was a minister. My maternal um, grandfather was a minister. I have two older brothers. Grew up in the church. When it came to the Apostles' Creed, I never had any doubts. I really did. It always rung true to me. But as a classic teenager, and ministers' kids fall into two categories, really, really good, and 10 of the 12 of us were really, really good, and two of us were not so good. My issue with, with God was, yes, I wanted Jesus as my Savior because I don't want to go to hell. But I had struggled with Jesus as Lord because my favorite false God is me. So even though I was in church twice on Sunday, catechism, Christian school, always loved the music of the church, the minister would start preaching and I'd be fly fishing in Montana or whatever, I, you know. When I went out with my wife, she assumed I was Christian. She never asked, do you love Jesus? And when we got married, we started devotional life. But truly, my favorite false god was still me. I was a hypocrite. February 19, 1980, our first child, Karen, was born. And a week later, I'm holding her in our upstairs apartment in Prince George, BC. There's like 20 feet of snow, it's 40 below. How we got that child home from the hospital, I, um, but I'm holding this baby, and all of a sudden, a spirit-infused thought came. Oh, she had strawberry blonde hair, too. She's, uh, but the thought that entered my mind was, I sure hope this baby loves Jesus. Now, that didn't come from me. But the second thought also didn't come from me. The second thought was, it would probably be better if I loved Jesus too. I'm smart, I was smart enough to know if I want this child to love Jesus, then I need to love Jesus too. And I'd like to say it was instant. I wrestled for about two days. You know, Am I finally going to have allowed Jesus Lord in my life? And I did. I didn't have to invite him in. He was crashing in. And I'm, I don't know you well enough, but there could be people here today, yeah, you believe the incarnation to be true, but it doesn't mean anything. And I'm not going to suggest you pray the sinner's prayer, Lord, forgive me. Uh, you don't care. I didn't care. I never prayed confession when I was 19, 20, 21. There's no sense for you even to pray Jesus be my savior because you don't care. But I want you to consider this. 
acknowledge to yourself you don't care. You know you should care, but you don't. And make that acknowledgement to God and say, you know, I know I should love you, I should allow you, but I don't care. And then you pray, Lord, change me. One of my favorite texts is Ezekiel 36, 26. I will take out your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And for the people here who know Jesus Christ, you know that. You know that just as well. You know that. You've had that heart transplant. God took out that heart of stone and gave you that heart of flesh. And you know it's by grace alone we have faith alone in Christ alone. But maybe you're that person. You know you should care, but you don't. Please at least acknowledge it to yourself, acknowledge it to God, and be re maybe be really dangerous and acknowledge it to one other person so they can pray with you and pray for you. We confess Jesus, God's one and only Son, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 100% God, 100% one of us, the right human sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the complete sacrifice. And so this time of year, we celebrate that. And whether you believe and embrace it, if you have doubts, we'll pray for you. If you have a hardness, we'll pray for you too. But God wants to bring all of us into that loving relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ, that perfect atonement for all our sins. Allow me to lead you in prayer. Lord God, we praise you. In Advent, we celebrate your wisdom and power. The people of Israel were waiting for Messiah, but they're waiting for a military man to, to free them from the Romans, and you surprised them. They never would have guessed that your son would become the son of Mary. And so we praise you for your wisdom and power with your mercy for us. Lord, if there are people here who have doubts, we pray that you would assure them that they can trust in your word. We pray that doubts can be swept away. And for those who, who believe but don't care, we pray that you would soften their hearts and that they would be willing at least to admit to themselves and to you that it is fully on you to give them a heart transplant. So we pray, Father, that in this Advent season, as a community, we can together celebrate Christ, our Savior, and Lord indeed. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We have a pianist who's going to lead us in our song. Um, the, the song I pick is, is called The Song of Mary. When I hear this song, I hear the, two first, the first two verses as uh, a female voice. So we're going to stand to sing, but the women are going to sing verses 1 and 2, and then together we'll sing the remaining. So I do invite you to rise to sing when the music begins.
Good morning, Riverside family. I just want to take a moment to give you a current update on our seafarers ministry. I hope you feel the Lord's peace, even now as we face the continuing pandemic. This pandemic has rewritten the normal way of living and has affected many areas of our lives. We don't know when we will or if we ever will return to the normal way of living. However, we are humbled and so thankful that even through these difficult times, the Lord was gracious to keep many of the seafarers and their families safe and secure. John and I have learned the importance of time and the need for running the race ahead of us with more urgency than ever. The world is in turmoil and perishing and we feel that God's will for us is to leap forward and share this gospel of Jesus Christ to those in the seafaring community. How will that happen? We don't know. But feel we must go on and after much prayer and consideration of the new Omicron variant, we must press forward, trusting that God will lead the way in whatever capacity that might be, whether it is on board ships or in the seafaring community. I sent an email to the Seafarer Center in Miami where we go each winter at least one or more days a week to minister to crew that come to the center and John leads church services for crew in their chapel. I received a response from Pastor Dan who runs the Seafarer Center and would like to read the email that he sent to us. Hi John and Grace, it is great to hear from you. The Seafarer's Ministry is open. We currently have smaller numbers of crew visiting the center and usually crew members are allowed off the ship from 10 a.m. till 2 p.m., Thursdays through Mondays. We have one volunteer who is helping me with handling the cruise ships. He is from Port Canaveral Seafarer Center and is living in his RV in Hollywood, Florida for a time to help me out. We could really use your help. We have been through a lot and our volunteers have either retired or are afraid of being exposed to COVID. We also would like to retire and are having a home built in Cove Springs, Florida, but we still have not found a replacement for us willing to take this vital ministry over. Please, please let us know when you arrive in Florida and what your availability is, since your help is desperately needed. It is great to hear from you as always, Pastor Dan. I have emailed captains of ships and first it was a yes to visit the ship in Port Everglades. As they are in port for the day, as passengers disembark and new passengers come on board. But then came more emails from these same captains that due to the Omicron, that all ships visits are canceled until further notice. So we are not allowed to board the ships. We were booked on two cruises, one on a Holland America ship and another on a Royal Caribbean ship. We are booked on those and able to access the crew in this way and to have John lead Bible studies and worship services for the crew in the passenger area where they usually meet around midnight in a conference room for worship. In whatever capacity the Lord chooses to lead us, whether that be on a vessel or at the Seafarer Center in Miami, we will humbly follow his leading. We are all in a state of fatigue surrounding the restrictions and adjustments that we have had to made for, make for almost two years. This has not been an easy time it is hard to imagine that even more restrictions will probably be coming. However, God is in control and he will give us the strength we need to get through. 
John 14, 24. Peace I, live with, uh, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We have no place to live. We are staying in a hotel of a couple, a Jewish couple that we met and who are giving us a generous uh, friends and family rate. Please pray that while we are there, we are able to find a place to live. Also, with the recent events on the news of this week, with upcoming changes, if the border closes and we hear that the border is going to close, we will leave immediately before that border closes. Um, all this could change, our plans could change, but our plan is to leave here on New Year's Day. We thank our church family for standing alongside of us in our efforts to spread the news, the good news to those crews and staff and guests on cruise board ships. We pray God for we praise God for your continued support and prayers for our mission, even during this time of trial. John and I wish you all a very joyful Christmas. May you be blessed as you celebrate our dear Savior's birth. Thank you. Allow me to lead you in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we give of our offerings to the ministry of this uh, local congregation and classes and denomination, and we think of John and Grace in their desire to serve in the seafarers' ministry, Lord, we pray that you grant them wisdom as they discern your will for their lives uh, as they discern when it is good to go. Lord, we pray that you would grant them safety in their travels, safety in their ministry. And certainly we understand that the more we are out and about, the greater our risk is for uh, getting this dreadful disease. But we recognize, too, the need for the good news to go out. And there are times when uh, the need is greater than and the concern. And so we thank you for their willingness to enter into places that might be difficult, whether it's the seafarers or on cruise ships. Lord, we pray that you would go before them, opening hearts and minds to the good news of Jesus Christ and encouraging sailors who already love you and are, they are able to uh, encourage them in the communion of the saints. Lord, we pray for your blessing. In Christ's name, amen. I invite the uh, praise team to come up, please. Sorry, our doxology is O Holy Night. I do invite you to rise when the music begins.
receive God's parting benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. Church of Christ was born, then the Spirit